my time with the Honourable Member for Brantford Brand. This week we learned the story of an Ottawa area senior who said he can no longer afford to heat his home or fuel his car, so he is giving up both. Rick Russell even put up a sign on his house declaring, quote, another senior loses his home due to high energy costs, telling reporters he can only afford a home without heat or heat without a home. He's not alone. Disabled grandmother Kathy Katula broke down into tears as the, at the Prime Minister's recent town hall meeting, demanding to know how she would pay his new carbon tax on her home heating when she's already struggling with $1,000 a month electricity bills imposed by the provincial Liberal government in Ontario. The Prime Minister gave her a warm hug, but unfortunately not warm enough to heat her home. These are not isolated cases. The 2016 Ontario Association of Food Banks report entitled Energy Poverty said, quote, since 2006, hydro rates have increased at a rate of 3.5 times inflation for peak hours and at a rate of eight times inflation for off-peak hours. 60,000 Ontarians have had their electricity cut off for failing to pay their bills, the report noted, adding that many food bank clients struggle with electricity bills of 300 to $700 a month. The food banks themselves say they are struggling to afford the electricity for their massive refrigerator systems. Ron Dunn, the executive director of Windsor, Windsor's downtown mission, has had people come to him and plea, quote, if you can help me with food, then I can pay some of this hydro bill before it gets cut off. These increases are the direct result of the Liberal Green Energy Act, which forces consumers to subsidize millionaire turbine and solar investors who sell overpriced, unneeded, and unreliable electricity to the government. While millionaires have prospered, Ontario has the worst poverty record of any province in Canada since the McGuinty Wynn Liberals took power. Between 2003 and 2014, the poverty rate dropped by one-third in British Columbia, the Prairies, Atlantic Canada, and Quebec. It didn't budge in Ontario. Over the same time period, Ontario had the largest increase in the percentage of the population earning less than half the median income. It also has the worst record for middle-income growth across the, pro across the country. Ontario's Auditor General calculated that the government subsidies of wind and solar power companies will cost consumers like Kathy and Rick $170 billion, making Onta the Ontario Liberal Green Energy Act likely the single largest wealth transfer from the poor and middle class to the super-rich in Canadian history. Now, the national carbon tax will do to gas, groceries, and heating costs exactly what the Green Energy Act has done to electricity. A Statistics Canada official recently testified at the House of Commons Human Resources Committee that increases in fuel, food, and other basic necessities necessarily increase the number of people living below the poverty line. Even carbon tax supporter Nicola Rivers admitted that the tax will raise the prices of gasoline by 11 cents a litre, ele electricity by another 10 percent, and natural gas by over 15 percent. Annually, it will cost $1,028 per person or $4,100 per family of four according to the Canadian Taxpayers' Federation. And this month, the Fraser Institute released proof that British Columbia, which has the least damaging carbon tax in the country, will still take a $870 million net uh, tax increase from, ta from British Columbian taxpayers. That is to say, 
the average family of four in British Columbia will pay $728 more in, new car in carbon taxes than they get back in offsetting tax relief. And that is the least damaging carbon tax in the country. We know that the burdens of these taxes fall disproportionately on the backs of those with the least for a number of reasons. First, we know that Stats Canada data shows that poor households spend roughly a third more of household income on the basic necessities that will be taxed, like gas, groceries, and heat. While wealthy households still buy these goods, they constitute a much smaller share of a wealthy household's income, and therefore the percentage tax increase is actually higher on those who are poor, which is the very definition of a, of a regressive tax. Second, the carbon tax will generate billions of dollars in new revenue for the government. Who will get that money? The answer is those who can afford to lobby for grants, rebates, and corporate welfare, under the guise, of course, of saving the environment. I return to the rebate for that you can now receive if you can afford to buy a $150,000 Tesla car. So I guess Rick Russell, who's now had to give up his truck, if he wants to get back any of the money he's paying in the carbon tax, he will have to find $150,000 to buy one of these fancy Teslas or Mercedes-Benz electric vehicles, and then he can get $15,000 back. In reality, those wealthy enough to lobby for these rebates will get all the money back, as is so often the case with the theory of trickle-down government. Those at the top end up with the most. So that's why I filed an access to information request to find out how much poor and middle class taxpayers will pay under the new uh, liberal carbon tax. And I asked for the government to provide documents such as briefing notes, analyses, projections, and emails regarding the impact of a, of a $50 a ton price on carbon or a carbon tax on the Canadian economy. Please include any analysis on the price of carbon. Uh, on the impact on the pr consumer price index, median incomes, low income, uh, low, ho low income household incomes, the poverty rate, the employment rate, and the unemployment rate. The response was ominous. Quote, imposing a carbon tax will lead to costs that will cascade throughout our economy, said this finance department document, referring to two tables that would tell how much households would pay. But those tables are blacked out. These tables would break down the cost of the carbon tax by income quintile for the very poor, the poor, the middle class, the upper income, and the rich. Now, the government says it wants to reduce the gap between rich and poor. Shouldn't they then jump at the opportunity to release data on the tax's impact on income inequality, unless they have something to hide? Could it be, Speaker, that after running an entire election campaign on the supposed promise of taking more from the rich so that they could give back to the poor, that the government is doing precisely the opposite and worse, trying to cover it up? The most basic principle of parliamentary democracy is that people must consent for the taxes that they pay through the assembled parliament. The Bill of Rights of 1689, which established the parliamentary system that we know today, it, 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 through the Mother, Mother Parliament in Britain, had as one of its basic principles what would become no taxation without representation. Quote, levying money for or to the use of the Crown without grant of Parliament is illegal. Simply put, government cannot, cannot tax what Parliament has not approved, but you cannot approve what you do not know. And therefore, there cannot be taxation without information. This motion calls for the re immediate release of that information. Now, these may seem like abstract concepts, but they are real to people like Kathy Katula and Rick Ru Russell and others who have no money to influence government or pull its levers. Two people seeking no program or welfare, mer merely asking for government to get off their backs and out of their pockets. They pay the bills. They have the right to see those bills. This motion would give them the chance. Anyone vote, voting against it would take that right away from them. Mr. Speaker, I ask the House to vote for this motion to bring the light of day to pass. This motion in the House of Commons is to, to stand for our duty to, to represent the common people here in this House 
of the commoners. Thank you.